on that. This is this uh, this little um, gadget I'm holding in my hand. Uh, it's called tippy top, and it is a, a rigid body, uh, a top, which uh, can be rotated, and uh, it has a very peculiar shape. I don't know whether this is visible. Yes, now it is visible. It is an essentially an empty shell, uh, which uh, is a sphere cut at a certain radius of the sphere. And there is this, this middle road is something with which you can start turning it around. And uh, that, uh, uh, that is extremely interesting device because when you start to rotate it it's on, a, on, a, on a desk, and unfortunately, I try it with the camera from my Mac and uh, that doesn't work for some reason. I have no idea why. I mean, there's nothing seeing you, you will be able to see on the screen. And that, then it all over the sudden, when you start to rotate it on this spherical part of it, then after several rotations, all over the sudden it flips and it starts rotated on that tip of the road. And the process of this jump is a, uh, a very tough problem from the nonlinear dynamics of a rigid body. And uh, there are lots of experts on it all over the world. In one is uh, a professor of physics at the Linköping University in Sweden, uh, Professor Wojciechowski, who was our colleague at Warsaw University for years. But, um, but I am not going to discuss the physics of that phenomenon, which is incredibly uh, instructive. It's, uh, it's even tougher than the other experiment, which I might have, if, if my camera worked well, I would be able to show you this is the so-called, uh, 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 it's it, it it is a device which I used to show that you can overcome the laws of conservation of angular momentum with sheer power of your will, and uh, that is uh, another of those devices. But again, you will be not able to see it here unless I figure out how to. Maybe I can record this. Now it came to me that I perhaps I should have recorded a film for rotating that using the external camera and then dump the, the film onto the computer and show you it. You will see why I have chosen that little device uh, today. All right, so let me share the screen and um, we will then continue uh, our lecture. So that's eight lecture. And um, uh, again, it's a problem with, uh, where is it? Uh, all right. And let's make it smaller. And, uh, and uh, this will be, basically a lecture about the anti-science. But before I get to the true anti-science, uh, let me tell you a, a true story which had happened to me and which had really attracted my interest to the looking up at the anti-science in literature and art in the this transition period between 19th and 20th century. And that is related with a, a writer whom we already discussed talking about the interests of uh, people with the four dimension and geometry it triggered by the Riemann uh, habilitation. And Wells had in 1896, written a book 
which is called the island of Dr. Moreau. And uh, this, this, what you see is, uh, is, the, is, is a picture taken from a movie under the same title, uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau. And the individual on that uh, picture is nobody else than Marlon Brando, who uh, performed as the Dr. Moreau. The story is that uh, there is a, 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 a disaster on the Pacific Ocean and uh, the, one of the passengers who had survived the crash of the, of the, of the, of the ship is saved himself in a small boat and that boat is taken by the currents in the ocean and it eventually ends up lands on the island and that island turned out to be inhabited island but is inhabited and owned uh, by um, it's owned by the Dr. Moreau uh, a, a French and today we will say the genetic expert and and the surgeon who was expelled from civilized world for his experiments and he ended up on the island and he uh, there are clones a uh, human beings with the different animals on that island so the island is inhabited with the clones of hybrid clones of humans with some kind of an animal. I'm and sorry, Dr. I'm afraid we cannot see the slide you are talking about. Excuse me? Uh, I'm afraid we cannot see the slide you are talking about because we can see only the title. Is that is that okay? Okay, well, I'm all right. Now you see it? No, still not. I'm sorry. You don't see that... that the name of John Frankenheimer? No, we can see the science and culture, like the, the, the title. So you only see the title, then I don't know what is, has happened because I'm sharing the screen and... Um, let me stop sharing and um, let me... Close it and uh, let me now share the screen. Now it doesn't appear here. Very good that you said it because otherwise it will be nonsense. Let me let me start again. Uh, and um, I don't know what what what, what had happened. Uh, all right. I, I I don't want to. Wait. That's just funny. Yeah. Are you seeing it now? Hello? Uh, yes, yes, we can see it okay, now. Let, 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 let's then me play it and you tell me, do you see it now? Yes, yes. Good, thanks a lot and I'm sorry. Thank you. But uh, I, don't know, that's, I mean, I cannot, I see this. So I, can, I mean, it's, it's very good that you tell it. So the, and, uh, and Dr. Moreau controls this, uh, population of the island by a device which is built into their body 
which is st uh, steered by a mysterious device he's carrying on his neck. And uh, the book was, as I said, written in 1896. And in, uh, in 96, 1996, I was in Canada. I was uh, uh, visiting uh, University of Alberta at Edmonton. And um, uh, I, I borrowed, uh, uh, that was a time where I, you, you could borrow the the films on the on the the tapes which you can play on the recorders that was before the discs were become popular and um, the the apartment I rented it was equipped with a television set with this uh, recorders I borrow from one of those at uh, that time they were everywhere the shops which rented the films. I borrowed the film, doc I, I, I realized that there is a recent movie of John Frankenheimer. That movie was released in August, 1996. And I, I borrow it and uh, I was watching it and stopped watching for the news, CBS news. And I switched the channel on the television set to the news. And the first news of that day was that it was disclosure of the fact that a few months earlier, the bunch of scientists in England have cloned the ship Dolly. Dolly was cloned in July, 1996. And that was a cliche, I mean, that's, uh, I was watching that dramatic movie and science joined it. So the film and the book, The Island of Dr. Moreau uh, had been uh, a something which triggered my interest in the, in the subject. And we will, uh, we will see in a moment some other uh, examples and we will be talking about it. As you remember, we were already talking a little bit about the anti-science when we were discussed the book by the Polish writer Jerzy Żuławski, uh, this trilogy of the, the Silver Moon, and the particularly the last volume, The Old Earth, where the uh, human beings from who were first transported to the moon and developed their, the civilization, which is different than the earth civilization, they come back to earth and what happens then. So uh, as you see the, this debate about the rule of a science in, 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 in the life and the civilization was extremely deeply interwoven in the in the life of the uh, intellectual part of uh, our uh, at least uh, in in certain parts of the earth of the of the globe and uh, and we will be uh, talking about it but i will uh, concentrate today on the the in some sense the beginning of a scientific anti-science movement, which is related to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the activities of this gentleman you see on the, on the picture. I hope you can see it. If you don't see it, let me know it again. This, the name of this gentleman is Oswald Spengler, and he was born in 1880 and died in 1936. Oswald Spengler was a mathematician. He got his PhD for a, a paper on the mathematics of Archimedes. So he was kind of a historian of mathematics rather than a actively progressing mathematics a scientist. And he was a high school teacher. Uh, that might sound 
pretty normal nowadays, but you have to remember that being a, a high school, uh, the say teacher, particularly in Germany, he was living in Bavaria, in Munich, that was a, a, a very prestigious position. And it was very difficult to get the job and many very distinguished and important in developing mathematics scientists before they got the job at the universities were teachers at the high schools. For example, uh, a Weierstrass, you must have remembered that name from the course of mathematical analysis. Uh, Weierstrass was a high school teacher in a very small town uh, on the north now, which is now north uh, east of Poland, close very essentially on the border with the Kaliningrad, the, the Königsberg, previously Königsberg uh, region, which is uh, Russian nowadays. And um, he was there, the high school teacher, and he was called for a chair at the University of Berlin from that little village that is really truly uh, a, a very small town, which the only interesting things for years in there, in, in addition to the fact that this was a hometown for Weierstrass, was that there was a huge army barracks next to that town of uh, Bartoszice is the Polish name of it. And um, so the, the Oswald Spengler was, was a respected high school teacher of mathematics and philosophy. And then the war started and uh, he, 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 due to his eye problems, he wasn't drafted. So he spent the, uh, uh, the life, the time of the war uh, in rather miserable uh, conditions in Munich. And through all the war, he was writing his Opus Magnum, his main book, which was the book, uh, which the German title is Der Untergang des Abendlandes, the demise of the Western countries, in some sense. Uh, Umreis seiner Morphologie der Weltgeschichte, uh, das, uh, a, 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 a draft of the morphology, the structure, internal structure of a history of the world. It appeared right after the end of the first war, and it consists of two volumes. The volume number one was a Gestalt und Wirklichkeit. The word Gestalt is important in philosophy. If you will ever be learning a philosophy, which I think it's worthwhile to read a good book, of the contemporary philosophy, you will be find and find that most of the philosophers discussing the philosophy of the turn of the 19th and 20th century is not even attempting to translate the word gestalt into the English, for example. It is a shape, in formally the gestalt is a shape, a, 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 a cloud representing the object it's, it's and and the wirklichkeit is the reality so it's the it's a that's difficult really to translate the gestalt and reality and uh, the second volume was the the perspective of the history of the of the world and that was a book where the Spengler had triggered the critical discussion of the science. And unfortunately, in spite of the fact that he was, a, as I said, the PhD in mathematics, uh, he, he did not understood science. And he was very, um, very, certain that his ideas are uh, truly correct. And let me show you a sentence out of that book. Pure contempla contemplative philosophy could have dispensed with experiment forever. He thought that 
they a thought, a human ideas are more important in shaping how the scientific description of our reality than the, than the experiment. So that was the gestalt, which was more important than the Wirklichkeit, in, according to him. Uh, and then the next sentence is, but not so the Faustian, Faustian symbol of a machine, which urged us to mechanical construction, even in the 12th century, and made perpetuum mobile the Prometheus idea of a Western intellectual. The word Faustian uh, is actually taken from the one of the most important plays ever written. But this is this famous play written by Johann Wolfgang Goethe, Faust. Uh, um, let me briefly tell you what was Faust. The Faust is a story about the scientist with the name Faust, who had spent most of his life trying to understand what is the life on earth for? Why do we have the civilization, etc.? And he is desperate that he has not come to any definite conclusions. And then the devil in the form of a chief devil, Mephistopheles, shows up and offers him, uh, well, as always, the devils offer that he will be getting all the wisdom available and he will continue his life as a young individual for years to come, but he had but that is only if he will sell his soul to the devil. And Faust does it. And then it is a story what is, uh, what is happening. And this Faustian idea is, uh, Faustian world is often used by the Ger in the German philosophy of the time as describing a Western part of a civilization. We shall see in a moment to what serious and dramatic mistakes that could lead. And uh, as you see, he hates the experimental way. For us, the first thing is ever the working hypothesis. For us, that is the readers of his book, the working hypothesis, our thought is the important thing. Uh, the very kind of thought product that is meaningless to our culture. That is from the decline of the West. And uh, 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 this is not only, uh, this is a kind of a principle on which the uh, ideas of the Spengler has been uh, built. And um, uh, this book is extremely difficult to read. It is, uh, uh, I, I, I never attempted to read it in German for my knowledge of German is just not up to the standards of being able to follow a complicated language of Spengler, but there are translations. And so I, I depend on the translation. And years later in 31, uh, uh, Spengler sort of, picked up from his original, uh, his ideas about the relation between a man and the techniques and publish a book, The Mensch, Der Mensch und Technik, a, a, a man and a techniques. And uh, I picked up from uh, the fundamental ideas of Spengler. The, the one idea is that the statistical methods are contradictory to the absolute truth. He hated a description which is not classical mechanics. That must be the reason from his PhD thesis about the Archimedes. He, it was already 31, so we already had the quantum mechanics blossoming and we also have the special, the general relativity theory, not only 
formulated by Albert Einstein, but also being experimentally verified by um, the, 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 the measuring of the perihelion precession of the, of, the, of the Mercury planet and so forth. But he writes the relativity theory is a cruel and cynical hypothesis. And about the quantum mechanics is that it is the Achilles heel of a contemporary science. So as you see, he had been extremely critical towards uh, contemporary science. And the only reason was that he was for some reason either unable to understood it or he didn't pay much of attention to improve his knowledge of mathematics so he will understand or he, anyway, that is the Spengler. And that was a, 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 a kind of a fundament, fundament on which all sorts of much less intellectually sound uh, directions of the criticism of the science start to propagate in the 30s. You also have to remember that this was a time uh, in Europe, which was um, in some sense similar to what we now have. The, the society was after truly devastated by the First World War, which was a tremendous shock to the, to the world, it was just subject to the grand economical crisis in the turn of the 30s and 20s. So uh, particularly in Germany, the, there was a tremendous collapse of the agriculture. If you will ever have a chance try to see the Ingwan Bergman movie, The Serpent's Egg, which is an incredible artistic description of the average life of people in Germany at the time. One of the reasons of this giant crisis in Germany, which resulted in the widespread hunger, was that uh, the Germany uh, had uh, the German agriculture has collapsed and it collapsed because uh, it was predicted that this will happen. And that is a short digression backwards. At the end of the 19th century, a British, uh, British uh, physicist, Crookes, and you might either remember it from the high school or you can do the see the contribution of Mr. Crookes to physics, watching up the luminescent lamp in the, in, the, in, the, in the Institute. And if you watch it, then you see this long tube where there is a, like, there is a, discharge uh, and the plasma is uh, shining the light from that uh, tube. But if you watch carefully, you will see that at both ends next to the electrodes of this lamp, there are a darker regions. And these dark regions are called the Crookes black. And that was discovered by Mr. Crookes. He was a very accomplished experimental physicist. And in the, at the end of the 19th century, he gave a talk in the Royal um, Society, predicting that the civilization will have a disaster, a worldwide collapse of a civilization due to the lack of food. This was a kind of a Malthusian idea, but Crookes had uh, supported that idea by showing that the agriculture all over the world was at that time supported by the natural fertilizers. There were the natural fertilizers were necessary to add the the nitrogen to the ground, which will be then 
taken by the vegetation. There are very few uh, the, 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 I, I forgot the English and in any other language name of the vegetation which is capable of taking the the the, the nitrogen out of the air uh, and uh, uh, put it back into the earth for the service of the other and um, the uh, nature fertilizers was a Chilean guano. It was imported from the, the, the there were the, the thousands of millions of tons of the, what was left by the birds on the islands and the shore of Chile. And there were special ships going over the oceans, bringing this, uh, uh, fertilizer to Europe, and there were factories which made the fertilizers out of the raw product. And crooks have estimated that all that natural supplies from Chile will be completely exhausted by something like a 1904 or 1905. And at the time, there was not even an idea how to replace those natural fertilizers. And right after the crooks uh, doomsday projection, uh, very independently, uh, Fritz Haber, German chemist, and the German engineer Bosch, uh, you can buy today the, the kitchen utensils and many electric equipments, which are manufactured still by the company having a name of Bosch. And uh, they have invented a method of making the ammonia out of the, out of the nitrogen from the air. And uh, independently, a Polish chemist who later on became a president of Poland before the Second War, Ignacy Moschitsky had developed the, the, the other technique, but the Faber and Bosch technique was better suitable for the mass production, so to say. And the, all the ammonia fertilizer all over the world, which are now manufacturers everywhere, they, have, they are manufactured by the, by the extent I mean, much developed by the Faber-Bosch method. And that method is on using the electric discharge to get the nitrogen and, uh, and fuse it with the, with the hydrogen to get the ammonia. And uh, ammonia is also necessary raw material for making the explosives. And... Um, German uh, general staff started the first, participated into the first war with too little supply of the uh, munition. And uh, when the war progressed and it was in the Blitzkrieg, the German, uh, Germany had confiscated already existing artificial fertilizers factories in order to produce the uh, ammunition. And uh, after the first war, these factories were declared to be the military factories. And the Treaty of Versailles had limited, uh, had limited operation of those factories in Germany. And therefore Germany was short of fertilizers and the agriculture was not capable and there were no already uh, natural fertilizers, and there was the collapse of the German uh, fertilizer, uh, the agriculture, and there was this economical disaster, which made the society very liable to the ideas propagated by these anti-scientific philosophers, among them those who had been founding fathers of the Nazi ideology which resulted then with the with a with a drama of a second world war 
uh, Oswald Spengler by himself was anti-Nazi. He left through the years when Hitler was already a, a chancellor and the Führer of the Third Reich, and he was against it. That is not true that the Spengler was in, in any sense related to the Nazi, but, uh, but it is also true that he is one of these main philosophers who shaken the uh, uh, belief of the society that there is a future for us and that the future can be uh, with the use of science and what science tell us about the world and about the society and replaced by the sick ideas of the uh, quasi-intellectuals like the Arthur Rosenberg and who knows who. So that is uh, uh, Oswald Spengler. And that is another uh, idea from Mr. Spengler, which turned out to be later on picked up and it is very actively pursued by many political scientists nowadays. And that is uh, what is written here. Fascination with techniques lead to decline of education, lowers intellectual power of new generations. Well, if you read today's uh, comments of the politicians and the journalists writing about the state of our society nowadays, that is very similar, isn't it? And East countries will use borrow it from the West education system in order to, for, uh, that is now the quotation, forge a weapon from it and direct it into the heart of the Faustian civilization. Uh, Spengler was afraid that the Western part of the world, particularly Germany, is losing the ability of developing science and consume the science although he by himself was criticizing that modern science. And he thought that the West Eastern countries will, the, uh, the Eastern countries started to develop their education system, uh, copying in many respects, the education system from the, depending on what kind of, under what civilization rule they were, whether they was British, Anglo-Saxon way of school or German or French, and that they will be sufficiently powerful to take over, over the Western countries. And that is in a some sense a prediction of uh, a, an idea of this gentleman and the consequence of this kind of completely erroneous thinking is, uh, has been forwarded by a contemporary uh, political philosopher, Samuel Huntington, which is called The Clash of a Civilization. And uh, there's this famous book uh, from 1996, which claimed that the world is falling into the giant conflict between different uh, civilization. And that is a map from the Huntington uh, book. And you see that these dark blues are the Faustian civilization region and the rest is the, this, the other civilization. The green is the Islamic and the bluish are the Orthodox and so forth and so forth. And this, um, this tidying up of the uh, understanding of the world and developing of a civilization which is tied to the religion is a consequence of thinking of people like Spengler and in some sense then expanded and uh, as far as I'm concerned in a completely wrong way by the Samuel Huntington. The story is that Mr. Huntington very, was very eager to become a member of American National Academy of Sciences and he never did, never become a member of the National Academy of Sciences because his membership in the Academy of Sciences was stopped by uh, mathematicians who were members of uh, uh, National Academy of Sciences, particularly 
a very famous mathematician, Lang. So uh, that is a story about the anti-science and that continue. This way of thinking like uh, Spengler, that relativity is, uh, is a cynical science and uh, quantum mechanics is Aristotelian heel of the uh, science is existing until today. And I'm showing you just uh, one example, which is in some sense very important. It is uh, activity of a British journalist, Brian Appleyard. And Appleyard had written a very important book other than understanding the present. And the book is um, based on a fundamental mistake, which is the identification of a science with uh, philosopher, uh, philosophy, uh, or should I rather say, uh, a, a, a concept which is called the scientist. And before I will talk about the relation, difference between science and scientist, uh, let me only show you uh, uh, that the Appleyard idea that the science is actually responsible for all the problems of a contemporary science uh, society is pick, was picked up by many other in, important uh, country journalists. For example, uh, uh, also a very famous British journalist, Bernard Levine, uh, had written on the July 29 of 94 in the Times of London, uh, an article from which the sentence comes. Today, scientists have to prove that the quark is a word of a bag of beans. Well, the argument is that we don't need any science. Then everything, is already well known and has been already derived and understood. So we don't need to do anything else. We rather have to concentrate on the everyday problems of a society, not some imagined issues like um, theory of elementary particles of something like this. And uh, the, uh, the apple yard, had also written uh, in 93 another book, which is called The Third Way. And uh, 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 this is a title of a criticism of Appleyard uh, writing by uh, Denis Alexander. And it, uh, it is, um, uh, it, that is based on the, this fundamental mistake of Appleyard then he identify a science with the scientist. So scientist is the ideology which says that the only, the only things which can be proven by a scientific methods can be used or applied by us in everyday life. That there is nothing else than the science, that there is no place for any other basic uh, ideas uh, in our life than those which can be proven in the laboratory. Uh, and you, I mean, most of you are not, uh, have not been in the Polish school, so you haven't learned about the Polish national poet, Adam Mickiewicz, who, who was, uh, uh, one of those first intellectuals who, who pointed out that there is a difference between science and scientist in one of his uh, poems. But, um, but I, uh, I'm not going to talk about it for obvious reasons. So this scientism is having nothing to do with the science because the science never ever claims that it has solved the problems. Science is always a, a basic idea about the science 
is that the scientific truth is that which can be falsified. And um, when you will be taking a course of philosophy or something, you will learn about the uh, uh, philosopher Karl Popper. And uh, this is the idea of a Popper about the falsification of a statement that the scientific statement is only true when can be when the method to prove that it is wrong is provided. So if there is something which cannot be proven to be wrong, there is not even an idea how what should happen in order to disprove that scientific theory, then it is not a scientific theory by itself. So uh, uh, the most of this uh, ideas forward by the Appleyard and Levine and many others is based on the erroneous understanding of the word of a science and a scientist. And in the 19th century, a British mathematician, William Clifford, had written a book, The Common Sense of Science. And uh, that book forwards an idea of the truth, which is called the a safe truth. And uh, we will be talking a little bit about the Clifford and the idea of a um, safe truth when we will be talking about the Jakub Bronowski. Here, I already mentioned his, um, he, the, his name and show you his picture. But we will be talking more in what follows about the Jakub Bronowski and his uh, ascent of men. And then we will be uh, uh, again talking about the concept of the safe truth. All right. So uh, in some sense, these ideas of upper yard, Levine, and so forth are essentially the same as in the book by Jerzy Żuławski, which I was discussing with you some weeks ago. And uh, I quote here from that book, a statement, citizens, uh, well, you can, uh, what we have gained so far, everything is enough for us, what we have gained so far. And there is this, part of a sentence which I already quoted for you. Likewise, all establishments support pure science and infertile research are abolished, leaving only institutions for, uh, for benefit and economy, for, uh, of social benefit and economic advantage. That is the, uh, uh, the basically the idea of Zhuaski, I mean, in, the, in this third volume, uh, the, the Old Earth, and that is basically the same what was picked up already in the 20th century, in the second half of the 20th century by philosophers or journalists or thinkers like uh, Appleyard and uh, the others. So that was, uh, but with what kind of phenomena in science by itself that anti-scientific movement in the literature and in the, our daily life was related. And in order to understand this and to see what was also similar, parallelly happening in the uh, first, uh, at, at the turn of the centuries, we have to say a few words about the science of a human mind. Uh, the philosophers and uh, biologists in the second half of the 19th century were very interested in understanding of a human mind. And if talking about that, it is impossible not to mention and actually concentrate on activities of this individual, Sigmund Freud. Freud was the Austrian uh, medical doctor who specialized in psychiatry and who uh, in, the, 
in the early, in the twenties, right after the first war, he became famous for developing a way of treating patients with a method which he called the psychoanalysis. And this psychoanalysis of Freud becomes extremely popular. And if I will be, I mean, first of all, I'm not qualified to, to talk about the uh, psychoanalysis, I can uh, suggest you a, a, a very, there, there are lots of good books about it, popular books about it. And, um, but, um, but the, 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 the Freud theory has become extremely popular. They were mushrooming groups of psychiatrists who were either adapting a Freud theory and Freud methods of treating patients or setting up the other groups of uh, similar uh, uh, way of uh, attempting to understand what is the nature of a human mind. And uh, that was also very popular in the general society, so to say. And uh, let me show you the uh, uh, poster of, uh, we already have been seeing the, uh, that, that there was a Polish writer, Jerzy uh, uh, Antoni Swojinski, who had written, I told you, a place about the relativity theory and so forth. And he also was writing a, a, a theater plays about the Freud theory. And this is a poster of one of those plays, which says a Freud theory of sleep. And that is a poster. So it was everywhere. People were very interested in it. And in, in some sense, in particular, that becomes extremely popular in the United States. And there are dramatic social consequences of the uh, misuse of the psychoanalysis by uh, 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 all sorts of therapeutic institutions and individuals in the United States, but that become a popular. So one was the philosophy of Sigmund Freud and uh, the other which is perhaps more related to the science was with the Swiss scientist Carl Jung. This is a Carl Jung picture. And uh, Freud was, uh, 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 he died in 39, right after he managed to emigrate from annexed by the Hitler of Austria to England. He was uh, very ill for a considerable part of his life. He was a smoker of cigars and he developed a cancer of the jaw and had the part of his jaw removed and replaced by the, uh, at that time, artificial jaw. And that he, he, he basically couldn't stand it anymore and committed, most probably have committed the suicide, assisted suicide when he got into England because he couldn't stand the, the pain of that cancer any, anymore. And uh, Carl Jung was a Swiss um, philosopher and psychiatrist. And uh, uh, he, is, uh, he was a prolific writer. He had written enormous amount of books already after a first, uh, second war in the fifties, he had managed to write a book about the flying saucers, the unidentified flying objects, which in the fifties have become very fashionable uh, topic of a discussion in particular in the United States. So Kurt Young jumped on the bandwagon and had written a book about the flying saucers. But the Kurt Young, uh, publication and he uh, he was originally a follower of Freud 
and even a head of the kind of a society of a psychoanalyst, psychoanalysis following Freud, but, um, but then he split with the Freud and developed his own theory and his own procedures. And he is extremely famous in science also because he had been through 40 years or so uh, treating by, e by mail, there were no email at that time, I'm sorry, treating by mail, uh, one of the most important physicists of the 20th century, Wolfgang Pauli. And uh, the Jung and Pauli were Swiss. And for a while they were living in the same uh, part of Zurich and uh, essentially a few hundred meters from each other and they seldom ever meet. And through all the time, they exchanged the letters addressing her professor. And uh, that was a curious thing. Pauli, whom you know from the course of quantum mechanics, from a Pauli exclusion principle, the rule which governs the existence of the matter. If there was no Pauli principle, there will be no matter. Uh, which we use, I mean. And uh, he, uh, he, he was a very unfortunate individual in his private life. And um, he was very interested and get very much interested in this uh, various, very weird ideas of the, of the young, somehow that had completely no influence on his activity as a scientist. But he was deeply thinking about the particular one part of the uh, uh, Carl Jung idea, which was called synchronicity. Synchronicity was a kind of extra extra uh, sensory perception and uh, ability of reading somebody's mind, telepathy, and so forth and so forth. Uh, this is a page out of the one of the letters which was written in the November 1950 by uh, 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 Wolfgang Pauli to Jung. Dear Professor Jung, it was with great interest that I read the latest version of your work on synchronicity. We basically agreed to the pass of the possibilities usefulness also in view of the Ryan experiments. Who was Mr. Ryan? Mr. Ryan was an American botanist who in the 30s had become a very famous for proving that uh, one of the popularly performing in various places, United States uh, mediums, uh, claiming to get us establishing connections with the, with the, our ancestors who are no longer living and so forth. And he had proven that this one of those famous mediums is a cheater. Well, they all are cheaters, in, but he had ex explicitly proven that this uh, uh, esoteric evening uh, performances was just uh, all crap. And uh, he became very famous and got interested in uh, trying to prove in scientific way that there are those parapsychical phenomena. And uh, at the University of Duke he, uh, in North Carolina, uh, which is a very famous university, uh, he had established an institute of uh, parapsychology. And uh, uh, he uh, asked uh, another psychologist, Mr. Zinner, and do not confuse 
this Zener from Zener cards used by the psychologists, with the Carl Zener, who was a distinguished physicist, material science physicist from Carnegie Mellon University, one of the greatest contribution to our understanding of the ferromagnetism, for example. But the, and the Zener had, this psychologist Zener had invented a special kind of a cards with some drawings on it, which um, were shown by the assistants of Ryan to people who claim that they have ability to read mind and uh, see the things through a distance and so forth. And he made the experiments showing that this phenomenon exists. It was turned out that all those experiments were faked. And they were mostly faked by the sloppy way of performing experiments by Ryan. Eventually, the institute was separated from Duke University, and Ryan and his wife spent the rest of their life until, I believe, 60s of last century, trying to show that the experiments can be rescued in some sense, but that was not the case. And that is this name, Ryan, which is uh, involved. That was just the beginning of the Ryan experiments. And as I said, they were all fake. And um, the picture uh, with the Pauli here is a picture of Wolfgang Pauli. This is this individual. And to the right of him is Niels Bohr. And what they are watching, they are watching that little toy I have shown you, this tippy top. Because a tippy top was first manufactured at that time, and it becomes a very fashionable toy to show on a play. I, if you buy the tippy top in some toy stores in Denmark, you must most probably can buy it in a box. On the cover of that box, there is a picture of a Niels Bohr playing with a tippy top with at that time King of Denmark. But this is a Wolfgang Pauli and two founding fathers of a quantum mechanics playing a game with the tippy top. So the, there was enormous amount of uh, quasi-scientific approach to attempts to understanding a human mind in the, uh, right after the First World War. But that wasn't only a quasi-scientific attempt to it, and it continued until today. This is a, a, a picture of a very famous uh, French psychiatrist, Jacques Lacan. And Lacan had been all over the intellectual scene of Europe and world in this, until he died. And uh, one of his main books, was a book, Four Basic Ideas of Psychoanalysis, published in 64. Eventually, uh, what would Lacan was doing, he was mixing uh, ideas of a psychoanalysis of Freud with the randomly chosen concepts of uh, contemporary mathematics. So he was talking about the topological effects in our mind and all that sort of nonsense. And um, he had his own school of treating patients and eventually he was expelled and he was not allowed to practice medicine anymore, but he was extremely active as a philosopher. And um, uh, that is, there's a lot of followers of Lacan today. And uh, you can easily find the books and publications and also the therapeutic institutions which claim they follow the Lacan ideas. And uh, I quote for you here a comment about the Lacan activities by Noam Chomsky. 
Noam Chomsky is a, probably the one of the most important linguists in our history, uh, still active researcher at, in Boston, who uh, he, he had completely reshaped our understanding of the origin of languages and so forth. And he's really, as I said, one of the leading scientists, in addition of being one of the political activists in the uh, United States, extremely leftist, but that's irrelevant. He's a fantastic scientist. And uh, his comment about Lacan is that Lacan was a colorful, self-confident charlatan. But in addition to those charlatans like Lacan, who uh, claimed to be a scientist and being deeply offended, if you will call them pseudoscientists, uh, there were others. And let me tell you a few words about the other side. On the turn of a century, the previous centuries, there were the Europe was and the United States and was fascinated with the, the, the ideas which have been brought to Europe by many different individuals. And I have picked up on the three of them for you to know. And one of them was the uh, a lady, Helena Blavatsky. Blavatsky was a daughter of a German, uh, I mean, German Russian family. Uh, uh, she was the wife of a, a Russian general and Clay with him, he traveled all over the vast empire. And uh, eventually they get separated and Mrs. Blavatsky claimed that she spent years in Asia, particularly in Tibet. And there where she met the monks who had teach her a special wisdom way of thinking about the world around us and about the human life. And she set up a, a, a kind of a institution and philosophy called Theosophic Institution, which has its, which exists until today. It has its center in a, a little village which is called Adyar, and Adyar is uh, is next to the city, one of the biggest cities in India. And I am I am afraid I had forgotten a contemporary. Well, I remember. I I, I forgot it. The, the, there was this recent change of names of cities in, and regions in India, and I'm. I, I'm, I forgot this. Anyway, Aydar is next to Madras, what used to be formerly Madras. And um, they, there is a center of a theosophy there. And um, that, was, uh, that is a picture from the page today and uh, what they are doing there. And uh, they, are, they are everywhere. And before a second war, theosophy was extremely popular in Poland. That was um, kind of the esoteric philosophy, which was followed in a curious way by many Polish high officers in the Polish army. And what is even more funny in the Polish police. And one of the main leaders of that theosophic um, movement or religion was uh, 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 an office, the very high officer of the Polish police and gendarmerie, uh, Kazimierz Chodkiewicz. And uh, there are lots of uh, interesting stories about how the Theosophers uh, had brought to Poland one of the 
chakrams of the, and um, there is a story about the king's castle in Krakow with the chakram, and that's always uh, now almost generally accepted to be historical events, but that all had happened in 1930s, right after the death of the Marshal Pilsudski. And it's related to the activities of those officers like Hotkevich and uh, a general who was extremely important in the Polish history, Karashevich Tomasz. And um, well, anyway, the theosophy was a very, very popular uh, uh, way of thinking. And they, they basically were another side of those ideas of the people like, 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 uh, like Jung and others claiming that there are some non-physical and not physical phenomena which are related to our activities of our brain. The other individual whom I would like to show you is, uh, is uh, a, a Russian and uh, philosopher, George Gurdjieff. And uh, this is the copy of a page from a spring 2007 of the <coughs> Gurdjieff International Review. And uh, uh, I, I'm not going even to tell you, I mean, this is such utter nonsense, but Gurdjieff had a student and the student was called uh, Peter Uspensky. He was also a Russian uh, uh, before the revolution and he emigrated during the revolution and end up in England, France, and the United States. And he died in 47. And uh, Uspinsky was a prolific writer. And well, the history makes a circle. He has been very interesting in connecting a parapsychology with the four dimensional world. And that is a page from the a book, internet bookstore in Poland, Gandalf, which still a few years ago was selling a Polish translation of Uspiński book called The Fourth Dimension. The Fourth Dimension, for some reason, attracted a tremendous interest. Apparently, not only the painters, we discussed the Cubis a few lectures ago, but also by those individuals of the uh, uh, from the uh, esoteric world. And uh, this is, I believe, a quotation from, they still continue writing. And this is, uh, uh, I just happen to have it for some reasons, the art bulletin from December 2000, where a certain individual, Mark Antif, had written a paper at the fourth dimension and futurism. And that is a lengthy quotation for it, which I believe I will skip. But that's continued to be continuously going. And um, this is a, a, a part of an interview with one of the journalists, Mr. Bova, had with the French philosopher Bruno Latour. Bruno Latour was almost a member of the French Academy of Sciences, but again, a members of that academy, physicists and mathematicians protested. But that is a good dissertation. And for example, I, I just make this sentence in the box, which is the most important. The mathematics qualifies its status as another language game. The language game is the cliche word, which is uh, the funding notion of that postmodernistic statement of the various narrations that uh, there is no basically a truth and everything is actually just the other narration, another talking about something. 
So, uh, and um, maybe we will say a few words about the, that again, talking about the Sokal phenomenon in what follows, but this is just that it is pretty recent uh, discussion. The Bruno Latour had written also many uh, books about the contemporary physics as seen by those kind of philosophers of esoteric from esoteric part of the world. And uh, they are complete nonsense as far as the physics is concerned. He doesn't understand a bit of what is the relativity or what is the quantum mechanics. Like, unfortunately, was Mr. Spengler, who has been a founding father of all that mess. All right. But uh, so let's go back now to anti-science side of it. That was uh, on the inter short thing to tell you that this, this, this parapsychological para world is still extremely active. There are journals in Poland which are published about it. There are people who are paying uh, uh, real money for being treated by those charlatans. And there is a Polish writer and a friend of mine, Tomasz Witkowski, who is publishing a book which, in articles in which he, he debunk the activities of those people, but they are growing like the mushrooms. The anti-science was becoming very popular in the 20s between uh, otherwise distinguished writers. Uh, and uh, this is uh, 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 Mr. George Chesterton, who was a very accomplished British writer. Uh, he is a founding father of uh, the book and the stories about the father Brown. Uh, Chesterton was a deeply religious individual. Uh, and uh, he was a Catholic in England, and he wrote a detective stories. And the uh, hero of it, a person who solved the mysteries, is a priest, a Father Brown. And truly, these are very nice detective stories. But the Chesterton was also extremely anti scientific. He was one of those people who claimed that we should stop uh, propagation of science, we are moving too fast, and so forth, and so forth. Very similar, like the Apple Yard 20 or so years, or so 30 years after him. So this was a Mr. Chester. But, but, at the same time, this uh, word of science, which Mr. Spengler called the Faustian word, had been very, in some sense, popular subject in the literature. And the literature from the 20s had been uh, attempting, in some sense, to bridge those both sides of the of the world. And um, I would like to show you a, a few examples. This is an example of a, a book uh, written by a German writer, Bernard Kellerman. And the, the book is called Der Tunnel, a tunnel. And that is a story about British American engineer, and Alan Varan, uh, uh, to who um, uh, has the idea of building up the under ocean tunnel, connecting United States with Europe, over which extremely fast trains will be moving and simplifying a connection between two continents. If you 
read that book, you almost immediately have association with the idea, which is a contemporary idea of Mr. Elon Musk about this tubes through which they, which will be the vacuum tubes connecting all the possible places on the globe through which this bullet fast trains or capsulas will carry the passengers. The philosophy of Alan and Elon Musk seems to be extremely similar. And uh, Mr. Allen starts, eventually he gathers the money and he start the construction, start the construction of a tunnel under the ocean. He gets into enormous complication. There is a giant catast catastrophe when that tunnel hits the underwater mountain and lots of people get killed. And eventually, he, there is, uh, of course, uh, a, a laugh story on the side of, uh, of the, this engineering part of the book. Eventually, he the, the project is completed. The trains are moving. And uh, almost the first thing the Allen sees when he emerges out of the tunnel is that there is no reason for the tunnel anymore because in the meantime, the aeroplanes have been developed and there is even faster communication and much more safer and cheaper between the continents via the planes. At the time, the, the, the Pan American was already flying uh, so-called flying boats all over the world. So the, the, the cool concept is, is a nonsense. But this is also the story showing how the, this Faustian thinking about the machinery, and uh, this is what Spengler was this, so against, that we, our technology does not have a limit, that we can build up everything what we can have is actually a contradiction to itself because the science develops other men, means of communication which are much faster and better. In some sense, this is a similar story as with uh, various concepts of electronic communication before the internet had eventually conquered the world on the turn of the 1920s and 21st century. The tunnel was a, a popular top book before the war. It's having, it had editions in all possible languages. In Polish language, it is available in the, after the Second World Translation because Mr. Kellerman, uh, who, uh, who survived the Second War, he was anti-Nazi. He had um, uh, been one of those intellectuals who was living in East Germany, and the book was translated into Polish because of the friendship with the, the Deutsche Demokratische Republik. But it also was a, a topic filmed very often, and this is a poster from a, a, a film made by the Bavaria film, is a German company in 33, right in the year when Hitler took power. And the, uh, the book, the, the play was called Tunnel. And uh, this is the film in French language. At that time, there was not a, the dubbing of the film in the different language than the language of the original version was not popular. And very often the same book, the same film, the same screenplay was filmed in the same stage set, stage set by different teams of actors speaking different language. 
So that was a film in French. And the main character in the film, this engineer Allen, was uh, played by Jean Gabin. Jean Gabin was one of these incredible French movie actors who was uh, 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 one of the co-play actors uh, of many Marlene Dietrich movies from before the war and so far. And he, after the war, he, as an elderly gentleman, had been starring in many French important movies, including a series of movies about this. Uh, well, and I mean, lots of them. And uh, the reason why I show that poster is that the edit, that the regime, that the director of that film, Curtis Bernard, was a French Jew. And therefore, he was expelled from Germany after the Hitler took power. And uh, Mr. Goebbels has written a special permit for uh, Curtis Bernard, which allowed him to return to Germany in the 33, from the January 33, the, 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 the Hitler was already in power and to finish that movie. So he had to do it with a special permit. And that is a, a picture from that movie. This is uh, Jean Gabin uh, uh, with, the, with the workers uh, protesting after these accidents, which killed so many, uh, so many of them. And the other uh, example, which I would like to show you, is the book written by a French, um, by a, I'm sorry, by a Czech writer, Jan Weiss, the Miller Dome, the, the house with the thousand floors. The book was written in 1929. This is a, a title page of it. And um, Jan Weiss, uh, the book was translated into Polish. And uh, after the Second War, uh, Jan Weiss uh, was actually, uh, from through almost all his life, a clerk in the foreign ministry of the Czechoslovakia before the Second War. And he, uh, he was there after the first, he survived the war and so forth. And what is this book? The book is The House of a Thousand floors. The story is uh, one of these dystopian stories uh, about the disaster caused by development of science. The, mm, the hero of that book is a wounded soldier from the First World War, who, after being shot on the battlefield, he wakes up in the basement of an enormous edifice, a structure, a building, which belongs to individual Mr. Miller. And uh, he wakes up there, and this is a the building which has a thousand floors. So it's something like this completely unrealistic buildings built up in Dubai. And uh, he, uh, and the building is still being built. So this is a, a construction which has not yet been finished and is ruled by this individual Miller who, and this, there is a continuous revolution in that building which progresses up the floors from the bottom up. And the hero of the, of the book is the in the uh, 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 wakes up there and turns out that he's assigned uh, the battle order to go over the building and find one of the leading persons in this revolt against Mr. Miller, uh, a certain princess 
and uh, the stories about how he goes up up those floors and eventually he he finds that princess and he get to the he they bet they are caught by the miller and and etc cetera, etc cetera. the the, the, this is one of these dystopian stories which were then uh, propagating. And uh, remarkable that this, uh, for some reason, there was this, 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 uh, this science, anti-science and dystopian picture of the world was popular in uh, Czechoslovakia before the war, because roughly at the same time, uh, uh, this we will be talking next week, but let me just briefly tell you what I will be telling you is that at the same time, a very famous, in contrast to Jan Weiss, a Czech writer Karl Chapek had written a theater play called R. U. R. U. R. Rosum's Universal Robots. And that is a play in which the notion robot was used for the same first time in history. The word robot, the idea of artificially created structure, which has all the obvious characteristics of a living organ and particularly humans is has been invented by the Karl Chapek and the play is a play about the a certain individual Rosums who had uh, developed a way of constructing robots and on the island which is somewhere in the in the it's not explained where but since the the communication with the island is through the ships which lives from Havre, which is a port in France. So they they uh, they uh, uh, they, they he set up the factory on that island with manufactures of humanoid robots, and those humanoid robots are there. And they are manufactured for various activities, from being an office clerks, from running the robot, the workers who run the factory, to the soldiers. And uh, the story is about the fact that at the one stage of the game, the robots revolt. And they revolt all over, they, they are everywhere, all over the world, because the humans are producing enormous amount of them. And they, um, they, the humans do not work anymore because everything is done by robots. And since they look like humans and they are better and better manufacturers, so they are more and more human like, they, they, uh, they revolt and they slain most of the people, um, essentially, according to the play, all of them. And the only thing they cannot do, they, in the process of the revolution, somehow they destroy a blueprint of how the factory works, how they are being produced and they cannot reproduce themselves. So they save one human being, one of the engineers from the original Rosum's factory. And that is a story how he, what happens later in, I, I mean, the play is seldomly played nowadays, but, the one of the, the reason why I'm talking to you about the airware is the Rossum's Universal Robots and Karl Chapek is that we have now a tremendous amount of a discussion about the artificial intelligence 
and what is the consequence of developing artificial intelligence and so forth. There is a, this writer, Mr. Harari, who writes, as far as I'm concerned, completely nonsensical books, but he's extremely popular. I mean, his books are everywhere. He, he writes them with enormous speed and without any sense, but that's another story. And uh, the, the people are discussing the issues about the artificial intelligence. But if you had ever read, it's in all possible languages in the internet, so you can easily get it from the internet. If you either read the airware or if you, if you will ever see it on the stage, then you find that you will be immediately aware of the fact that most of those issues discuss nowadays, they have been put, put, post by Chapek in his play, Rossum's Universal Robot. So in the something sense, he had not only invented the word robot, but he also invented all those topics uh, for that. If, uh, unfortunately, that's only in Polish, I, I gave a, a full lecture on the on that play um, at the Theater Academy in Krakow a few years ago. So I, for those of you who are interested and can understand Polish, I can provide you the link to the recorded talk on the uh, airware and uh, how it is related with the, with the Faustian world, with the Goethe Faust play for the some of these ideas from the airware are already in the in the Faust. I, I don't know whether you have seen the Faust ever on a stage or read the, the play. Then at the one stage, this uh, due to the reju rejuvenated Faust due to his collab pact with Mephistophel, he gets into the student cavern in, 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 in Leipzig, uh, in Germany, in, in, the, in, the, in the cavernous restaurant or club of students called Auersbach Keller. That, is, that place exists so still in Leipzig. You can go to Auersbach Keller and have a beer there. And um, he met there a certain fellow who becomes his assistant, Mr. Wagner, who works on creating homunculus, uh, creating artificial life. And he has a pro, he has a glass jar in which one of these homunculus is, is actually living. So uh, that is, uh, I believe, all, all for today. And uh, let me kindly again, ask you to prepare that list of email addresses, which I will appreciate it if you will mail to me. And uh, we see each other next week. And uh, let me stop uh, sharing the screen. And, um, and uh, unfortunately, and maybe I will figure out how to show you how the tippy top, if you have never seen a tippy top in action that Maybe I will somehow manage to make that movie, but I'm I'm not good in making this movies with the with the telephones and something. But I I I will do an honest try to prepare it for next week. So thanks for being with me, and see you next week. Bye bye.